Welcome back to Having a Gas, the podcast that talks to the great and the good of the creative industries. And today, I'm having a gas with Mark Elwood, the ECD of Leo Burnett, London. It's really good to be here. Thanks for having us here on Chancery Lane so early in the morning. Um, and uh, yeah, what's your what's your commute like, by the way? How'd you get in? Are you uh, pretty simple, actually? I've moved to Surrey about four months ago, so I've got thirty five minutes Ideal. into Waterloo and straight over the bridge. Yeah, so it's not is it is it still? I know it's a boring thing for I'm not a Londoner, so for Londoners this might be boring, but is it still palpably different than it was pre pandemic? It's getting there. I think just the last couple of months, you've felt London get busier. I mean, it's been some days you walk in and it's a ghost town. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But definitely, you can start to feel it. You can feel a bit of tourism coming back as well. Yeah. Which is, you know, uh, what has probably been missed, particularly in places like Covent Garden or whatever, you know, that... Well, it's just, just that, like, very, there. very much more just, like, all the locals are here and no one else. Exactly that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I, when was I, I was last year, it doesn't matter when, like, six weeks ago, probably, and, uh, yeah, it still felt like I could wander around on, like, a Friday night at about 5pm and uh, not ever have to move out of anyone's way. Yeah, exactly. You know? And so. but the pubs aren't as busy, you know, that's the thing, at Friday night... Uh, uh, in Soho is notoriously, you know, packed, but you can definitely get to a bar quicker. What's the local for people here at Leo's? Uh, well, either the pregnant man, which is in, actually in the building, or kind of uh, anywhere that sells a half decent beer. Yeah. People go to different places, but the PM is probably where we end up most. That's a uh, that's an endorsement, uh, if I ever heard exactly of one. Exactly that. So, um, I guess first of all, uh, how did you come to be here to be, you know, overseeing a a uh, creative department in a legacy agency, you know, with a huge reputation. Um, you know, where, where, where did this all start? Uh, God. Um, well, I started as an apprentice yeah. in typesetting when I was 16. I left school uh, with hardly any qualifications, um, which I lied about on my CV. I'll say that now. Mm-hmm. Um, and went into uh, typesetting at that time, you know, back in whenever that was. God, it seems like a long time ago. It was when you know, there wasn't in-house design studios. So there was typographers, as they were known at the agencies, and they got their type outsourced into different companies. And I did a four-year apprenticeship there. So I came into the industry in not in on the other kind of side of advertising, it's worse, so on the kind of more, you know, uh, typesetting side, which, you know, meant I didn't work in an agency at the time. You were so, supplying the creative department. Exactly that, yeah. That's, that seems so... Um, arcane to someone like me because I, I don't understand that at all the typesetting mm. what, what mm. comes into you when you're doing that what comes it was I mean god it's, it's it's an old school process when you look at how a design studio works now but it was genuinely like a, a layout a markup a handwritten markup that you then set in a specific font as specified by the typographer you kerned it manually you know the craft involved in it was incredible you know it was all all the type um, was on glass grids, which I mean, it'll blow people's minds to think about that now. Yeah. That you load it into a machine and then you had to, you know, develop the film, develop the bromide for that. But it taught you an incredible amount of craft. You know, early in my career, it was all around just the craft side of things and how to kern type and what looks good and what doesn't. And it was just drummed into you for four years of what yeah. looks good, what doesn't. But I realized quite quickly, you know, part of my job was genuinely driving about on a motorbike, delivering what we've done. You know, when you're an apprentice, you have to do everything, you know, get the sandwiches, you know, to try and get onto the machines to do the job that you actually want to do. But part of it was delivering it to the various different advertising agencies. And my first job, we worked for Simons Palmer, Colin Dickinson Pierce, Saatchi's, you know, big names. And, and you realise that's where it looked fun. And people looked like they had money. (laughs) And, you know, (laughs) it was exciting going into those agencies. So I kind of wanted to get into that side of it. I just didn't quite know how at that moment. All of these podcasts that I've done with, let's say, I think people who are your contemporaries, people like Dave Dye, they all say that that kind of thing. They say, you know, I had a look. I didn't really... Uh, I, know, I know, I think Dave was quite ambitious, but a lot mm. of people say, I had a look at the agency and it just looked really awesome mm. and wanted to be part of it. And it looked like there was money to be made as well. So you yeah, get a good life. completely. Do you think young people see that now in the age, in the industry? Gosh, hard. Um, mm. it's, it's a very different generation. I mean, from where we were, when we were so kind of terrified about, you know, when you had a job, you kept that job. Yeah. And you really kind of worked hard every day to kind of do that. And I think there's a different mentality to that now. I don't think it's 
worse. No. You know, when you look at the pandemic or what um, Gen Z talent has brought to the table in that is flexible working. I think cut to the pandemic being 15 years ago, we'd have all been back in the office, you know, um, that my generation, as it were, if you look at it like that, you know, still wanting to be in the office and work, whereas yeah. they, ca- they have brought that feeling of flexibility to it. And I, you know, I completely wholeheartedly agree with that as well. And then, you learn from every generation. The, uh, yeah, well, uh, absolutely. And, um, there's uh, the, the eternal debate is what are we, what's, what are we gaining that's going to be worth having? What are we losing that we should mm. maybe not lose? Um, which is always an interesting discussion. The thing I was taking from what you were describing about your apprenticeship there um, is that you would have a microscopic focus on a specific discipline, yeah, which is do the type. Fine. And of course, people my age, because I'm not a kid anymore, I'm mm. not 29, but people, I, I got, you know, a, a laptop when I was, uh, and I had a Mac Mini when I was 16 and got Final Cut for 100 quid or something. Yeah, yeah. And then it's like, right, what do all these things mean? I don't know what kerning means. I don't know what, uh, I can't remember the other words. You just mm. mentioned kerning, so I remember mm. it. Yeah. All these things, trying to put your own type on it. Mm. And so you, try, you, you had the opportunity for the first time to try and be a jack of all trades. Yeah. But you had a much more broad mm. kind of view. Mm. What, do you, have, you seen, have you seen that have like an effect over the last 10 years where people have learned just a macro thing, like I've learned Photoshop, not that I've learned colouring. You or still lettering. have specialists, I think, don't you? You know, if you, you're off the wave later, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sound engineer, yeah. It's, it's incredible skill, you know, or colourist. But, you know, still in our um, design studio, there's absolute typography specialists, you know, and you have to have that skill set, I think. But then saying that, you know, I interviewed someone yesterday who called themselves a creative polymath, which I thought was really interesting, who can do podcasts or, you know, design, art direct, and wants to do everything. And I think that's, you know, great for some people and not so good for others. I think some people like to specialise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, The the thing that I'm seeing with the the, the Gen Z talent as well Mm. at the moment is, um, they're digital natives. They've had Google since they were born. Mm. And, you know, to me, Google was when I was in like year six at primary school. Yeah. And perhaps to you, it was when you were embedded in an agency. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. Don't so, want to go back there. <laughs> but we, um, we've, got this, um, we've got this kid called uh, Raymar working with us at the moment. Mm. He's like six foot three guy from Moss Side. And um, we wanted to shoot some content the other day. And our uh, videographer here, Chris, just lent us a gimbal. I said, Raymar, how does this work? And he went, oh, I don't know. We just went... Straight into YouTube, he was an expert. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and it is incredible. I mean, that's that skill that you've got now, and you know, we all do it. We're all constantly sucking in stuff from the internet, and also, you know, that inspiration is so much wider than it was. You know, I'm constantly doing that as well. You know, but whereas before it was books, you know, that's all you could do. You walked walked into an advertising agency when you were first in it, and you know, saying this to Shaka the other day, you know, you'd steal the books. You'd nick books because you'd go, I need, I need to have that reference book, you know. Or when it was a say at Abbott Mead Vickers, everybody sat on their desk with old D and Ds in front of them, you know, looking constantly through other ads to, yeah. you know, either get inspiration or just to know what's been before. But, you know, it's it's weird. That doesn't happen anymore. And quite rightly, I don't think it needs to. Can, in some way. can we talk for a minute about because I'm 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 sort of industry adjacent, mm. not directly in the advertising industry, about what's happened with the there was a bit of I, I'm a bit out of the loop on the controversy about the DNAD annual and, and what's going on with that. I'm well out of the loop on right, that. Okay. I have no idea. Uh, I mean, has it gone digital? Is that the is that the the big controversy? I had the impression that was what was going on. Yeah. I mean. I think it's brilliant if you want to do a book. I mean, books have a value, don't they? I, yeah. I love sitting down with a book still. I think, you know, it makes it something that's just, it's a different experience, isn't it? So, I, but I can also see the argument for not having a book, yeah. you know, and, you know, canned lions, obviously, digital resource and all of that is kind of, it's probably the way forward, really. It's, it's, if you, you have to at least experiment ways. to see where it yeah, can go, don't you? Definitely. Um, but yeah, I think there was a sort of a cohort of um, uh, loyalists who uh, perhaps designed their own version of the DNA D annual yeah. in response. But, but then the, quite, it's quite an old school thing, isn't it? To kind of want that. I mean, I've never genuinely in the last, I've got a couple of agencies I've worked at, seen anybody flicking through DNA D. I yeah. genuinely haven't, you know, and 
they might Google stuff to find out who's done what or look for that resource. But I don't, I don't see it harming the work. Right, yeah. You know, I don't see it kind of uh, being, being something that's um, detrimental, yeah. you know. I think it was, there was a funny moment that happened to me, Vickers, I always remember it, where Peter Suter actually pulled us all together as a creative department and kind of told us to stop doing that and told us to go home you know, more because the work, you, the, what you, world you see and the world you take in when you're outside of work is your inspiration most of the time. That was his message. To and us. you don't, you don't want to end up in a feedback loop of making advertising that's yeah. like other advertising. It's also, you know, it's funny, um, Augusto Solo, who I worked with at 101, you know, this brilliant creative, called it mad cow disease. Right. Because it's like you're eating advertising to do advertising to yes, do that. Yes. And it's like a really interesting kind of analogy for it was his way of looking at it. And I've, I've always remembered that. It's like, why do you need uh, to look at other adverts to make advertising? Where's your inspiration come from? Is it art? Is it a film? Is it yeah. anywhere? Is it, you know, a bit of packaging? Whatever that is, it doesn't really matter. It's like, how does that idea come to you? It might be something that someone says in a pub or yeah. what your mum said to you when you were little. It doesn't matter. And because ultimately the people you're trying to address are all out there, not in here, yeah. aren't they? So. Well, yeah, it's populist creativity. That's yeah. what we believe in. And it's like, they are all out there and you need to know how they're thinking and what they're doing rather than just what the ad industry is doing. You know, Shaka puts that brilliantly. We make adverts for the UK yeah. and people out there, not for the village. Yeah, yes, I the village. Important. So how, do you, how are you and, and, and Shaka managing that within the department here and, how's, and, and through the last bizarre two years of working from home and not having everyone in here all hunched around the same resources. How has it been trying to, uh, you know, uh, field the creative work from the team in, with such a, everyone in such disparate places, all potentially drawing on different influences? Mm, God, it's been tough. Yeah. You know, we made sure we met up uh, every week during the pandemic and it was brilliant. You know, it was, even in lockdown, we kind of used to go for a bit of a walk yeah. at certain times, you know, as man and wife or whatever Shaka liked to call us <laughs> at that time, Phil and Holly. Um, you know, it's it's important that we were constantly talking and talking about the work and, and trying to find the right things in the work and then feedback to the team. It's really difficult yeah. to communicate during that time because you just don't have the time to speak to everybody. You can't nurture the department uh, like I think we both would want to. So venturing back into the office now has, has been a joy, to be honest, to be able to sit and speak to people face to face. You've just got to keep, um, you know, in Zoom world, I think you need to check in that little bit more if you can. But with the work, I think the, the agency knows where we're going. They know what our proposition is. It's very clear what we do. Mm -hmm. So I think keeping talking about that was one of the most important things. You know, we I had a lot of all-staff meetings where you're talking about populist creativity, what that means, how that manifests itself in the work itself. And when you start talking about that a lot and constantly, I think it goes in and people can, can then guide themselves. But we've also got, you know, incredible staff. We've got a great set of creative directors. We've got very talented individuals that are they're bright and they get it. And, you know, they can self-regulate really well. And I think that's one of the most impressive things that I've seen is people's self-regulation and self-policing the work and yeah. really trying to do that as well as, you know, being guided by creative directors or peers or, you know, me or Shaka. It's been really, really good. And I think that's worked across the board, across all the departments. You know, it's a team team sport. But it's hard. So it, there's, um, there is a preference for um, having everyone, let's say, within reach to be able to just check in and advise, or instead of having these scheduled, I've got a 30-minute team to then another team. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. I mean, there's the genuinely, I mean, you, you get through it, it's yeah. fine, and it works. We all know that. We've made it work. But I think it's the smaller conversations are sometimes the most important ones. The walking past someone and then just going, have you got a second? And it can be a two-minute conversation that, that could stop someone, you know, doing something for two days that they're wasting their time on, but... You know, that's priceless, I think. Yeah. You know, and also just the camaraderie of it. And what are you doing then? You know, being nosy and curious and inquisitive is part of our business. So being able to guide and help uh, more regularly is good. But then, you know, people still want the flexibility. And I think that's great. If you 
it doesn't matter where, where you work particularly, it's how you yeah. do you do it and is it good? The um, sort of serendipitous little conversation I'm reminded of, um, and I hope I've got this right, I might be getting the anecdote wrong, forgive me if I am, uh, with uh, Richard Huntington next door mm. at Sarge, yeah. was saying when they, had, when they had a meeting with Direct Line, mm. and they said, you know, uh, we're perceived as kind of hustlers and shysters and mm. things like this, and someone said, it's a bit like that, you know, character in Pulp Fiction, isn't it? And that's where they got the Winston Wolf Harvey that's Keitel funny. campaign. Yeah, it's tiny things, Yeah, you know, I think that's right. I think, you know, Sometimes first idea is the best, isn't it? Yeah, of course. So um, true. let's talk about the work that um, I want to, I'm interested to hear about how you and Shaka handle pitching uh, in a minute, but there's a, a big thing I don't want to skip over, which is mm. that before here, eight, you've been here for 18 months, you said. Yeah, I think when exactly. We're off, Mike, I joined kind of lockdown. Um, before that, you were doing government comms for um, Mull and Mull Lowe, Lowe, is that right? Yeah, we so I had my own agency called 101, which we sold to Mull and Lowe, and we were on our three-year earn out, as yeah. it were. So I only touched that for like the first, God knows how long it was, actually. I mean, it seemed like quite a long time, but it was probably only three or four months, you know, when it first uh, came into the agency. And, I mean, it's inc- incredibly interesting because it was the first bit, you weren't really locked down. We were in and out of London. You know, everybody else was taking it quite seriously at that yeah. time as well, you know. Remember the first couple of days of it when I was going in and out of London, you know, in the car. I was just driving into cabinet office, and there was no one around. You know, the police were around. That was yeah. about it. And it was quite an interesting, you know, time for that really because it didn't feel like I've ever been as locked down as the rest of the public in that way, yeah. which is a, a blessing and a curse because it was pretty relentless hard work. You know, yeah. long days. Yeah, completely. I mean, I remember the first time we shot Chris Whitty. So, who's amazing, by the way. I couldn't... uh, The respect I've got for him is unbelievable because, you know, we put him in front of a camera. It's not his job. No, not by a long shot. No, not at all. And I think we arrived to shoot him at, I think it was like five five o'clock in the morning, I was working down to Department of Health and Social (laughs) Care. And Chris was actually in front of us, and I didn't know him then, or, yeah. or hadn't, you know, obviously had anything to do with him by then. But he was in front of us walking in, and we were meant to shoot him at eight, so we were setting up, doing whatever you do. I think we got to him at nine o'clock that night. So he'd worked all the way through, and he was going, he, he left us, and, you know, we shot him for whatever genuinely 40 minutes or something. And the ad had to be on there the next day. I mean, it was all the way through the night. Sound, edit, get it out. Just going through know, the which night. Which was the, the first part, really big part of the campaign. I'm going to stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. Part of the campaign. But he was going, he was cracking on. No, I mean, yeah. he was, his day wasn't ever over, I don't think. No, I got that impression. An incredible amount of time. So these were so you were doing these like um like you said five in the morning, which means if that's if that was call time, then you're up at four and then working yeah, through exactly. till about midnight and yeah, and you and it it genuinely didn't stop at any given moment. You know, you could be and the team that have worked all the way through. I mean, I've hired a couple of the people that were on the design side of things here. I hired uh, a creative director Dave Allen who runs design and Augusta. Linquist, who, who were brilliant because that team just didn't stop. The amount of uh, design that came out of that, as well as film, as well as Mark Strong recording uh, radio every what seemed like twenty minutes. I mean, we were, you, you would write a radio ad and it would be approved in ten minutes, and you'd be getting him to go under his duvet wherever he was. And is that how it was being done? Pretty much. Yeah. Wow. And genuinely, it was. You know. Yeah. And you'd have to pull him back from sounding like he was the sexiest man alive and kind of yeah. being quite serious at times. Well, if, you're gonna have, if you're going to have a voice doing sort of instructive mm. comms, that's the one Exactly, to have, yeah. It? Mark Strong, the coronavirus. Yeah. yeah. It's brilliant. You know. <laughs> I think Mark could play you in the movie of that. <laughs> <one>. <laughs> I don't know about that. He's, <laughs> he's got, actually, he's got less hair than me, which, I've done, which is not, I mean, it's pretty unusual. I'll have Mark Strong and Jason Statham. Yeah, maybe. exactly. Uh, I'll, Dan- I'll go for Statham. Daniel Radcliffe is me in this scene. Um, <laughs> so... So yeah, um, but uh, so that was a big, big uh, responsibility. The likes 
of which, you know, it, you don't, I imagine, normally get in this industry. It's like a once in a lifetime moment, not because you don't get mm. big jobs and big demanding clients, but the, the, the it's just not always as important as that. No, definitely not. And, you know, uh, I was chatting to David about it actually the other day and saying that I think at some point, even though, look, I didn't agree with some of the communications, obviously, it's, there's, there wasn't a lot of pushback when you're talk, dealing with the government, you know. And I've, I've heard people talk about it going, oh, God, that art direction, or, oh, my God, you know, how did you get to, I wasn't there, but, you know, hands, face, space, or whatever it mm. was. This is stuff that was being turned around in days yeah. through the government. And, you know, there wasn't a bit of a meeting about, really, is it green or blue? Or how do we put this? Is there a better line than that? Let's all go away for you know, three weeks and have a chat about it. That's just not how it worked. It was three hours. unbelievably breakneck, yeah. Mm. And, you know, Tom Knox, who ran it at Mullen was absolutely amazing. You know, don't know how he kept going. He's, yeah. he's an incredible kind of guy. And um, the, the breakneck pace of it didn't allow you to be... I think the comms look great, and I think there will be an exhibition of it at some, at some point, you know, in 25 years' time. Yeah. The design museum will have a exhibition on on, on that, that that comms because I think it will be that important when we look back on it. Yeah, and it's a great thing to have touched. Coffee wise, everything seems to be done in threes. Was that like an instruction, <laughs> or was that? Yeah. It's become a joke. I mean, even the Spectator were um, writing about that. I think, and and Private Eye, I think at one point, which was making me laugh. Um, I don't. I, I genuinely, I don't know. I don't think it was. It started, obviously, life as um, stay home, protect the NHS and save lives, mm -hmm. which I still think is an incredible line. You yeah. know, it's a, it's a brilliant line to communicate with. Then evolving that as you went along was obviously better than starting again. Mm. People became familiar with the rhythm of yeah. it. The nation became familiar with it. And, it's, and I think that's why it stayed that way. And yeah. I kind of tend to agree with it. I mean, whether you, whether you like, like them or not, and whether they ran out of steam as we all ran out of steam is a different conversation. Yeah. You know? I think it could just be like a kind of, a, a, probably a coincidence because, you know, like uh, th threes is not like an uncommon thing because it's like jokes, isn't Completely, it? You go, yeah. you know, what is this? Uh, something that set up feed yeah. line punchline and yeah. it's because it had a, it rang along with get Brexit done and then there was get boosted now and then what <laughs> yeah. was it you know hands face space face exactly it's, just, it's a good it's a good technique to get a message it in. is whether it ran out I'm not yeah. sure you know I wasn't there then and you know I wouldn't have claimed to have done anything differently because like I said it wasn't particularly uh, it's not it wasn't a lot of the time um, a relationship you could be pushing back on no. you know it's a difficult time for the nation and I think everybody that worked on it just did a brilliant job. Yeah. I'm really pleased to have done it. I mean, it's, it's, it was a life experience, I think, just even for a few months. Yeah, and um, I think in a very, very good reason we can, well, let's just say, let's hope it doesn't happen again, but a yeah. once-in-a-lifetime experience to have done. Well, you know, you look around now and there's still people dropping like flies with it, isn't there? Yeah. You know, I had it three weeks ago. Yes, so, in fact, uh, my old mum has just come down with it this morning yeah. back in Manchester. So. And hopefully it will just, you know, touch wood that it disappears and, yeah. you know, or gets just to the point of being a flu. Yes, of course. Like but we are still here at, you know, Leo Burnett's London looking out over a pretty, it's still a pretty, you know, sparse office. I mm. imagine if this was 2019, that would be pretty heaving right now. Yeah, it will be. And the funny thing is, it, it will get busy later. I mean, there was probably 50, 60 in yesterday. Wow. So, wow. you know, it depends on the day as well. You know, Tuesdays, we, we, we're trying to do three days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You know, that's flexible as well. But, you know, usually in here, Tuesdays, Thursdays, it's pretty Heavy, yeah. And um, people are enjoying it, you know, enjoying the culture, enjoying the vibe again. So. I saw people on Twitter saying, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, don't forget that back in the day it was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, possibly Sunday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it's good. But, you know, like we were saying earlier, if you can work flexibly, yeah. you know, a lot of the, we were talking about this slightly earlier, you know, for strategy, mm -hmm. it's been fantastic for them to be able to think the way they, they want to, which is in a quieter environment. Yeah. Whereas a lot of creatives still need that as well, whereas others just love the, the, 
the thrill and fun of being in the office or, you know, the camaraderie of it and uh, being able to check in with people. So, of course, everybody's different. So let's talk about the work that's going on now at Leo's. So um, you mentioned you've got uh, a few flagship accounts. Uh, we know there is Premier Inn, Tui, mm -hmm. Kellogg's, McDonald's. Mm -hmm. and I'd, I'd count all, all of our accounts as flagship accounts. Of course, I, it's, yeah. It's an interesting conversation to have because, you know, across the board, we've got some incredible accounts. I, I think it's, um, they're all... It's all a level playing field, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? Well, how do you spin all those plates? Because we, at Gas Music, we do music, and mm. uh, pretty straightforwardly, mm. it's a simple brand. And um, the thing that, you know, me and our other composers and, and producers struggle with sometimes is flipping between genres, flipping yep. between different projects. Yep. So how do, how do you manage working with such disparate, you know, creative needs? Mm. I think the thing is, when, when we talked about earlier, we touched on populist creativity. When you've got a, a brilliant, you know, proposition, mm -hmm. it really helps you work across the whole business because you know where you're going to go. You know what kind of work you, you want to make. You know what kind of tone you have to deliver within that work as well. It makes it easier. I mean, it's not saying it's not busy. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like you've just touched on, we've got McDonald's, Skoda, you know, AXA. There's some big pieces of business, Kellogg's, you know, Butlins, whatever that is, it's all big business. Yeah. And they all expect the same standard of work, yeah. you know, from us, which is at a credibly high level. So, you know, you, you're constantly trying to do the best work you can for each of those uh, businesses, respective of size. I mean, you, you hear agencies talk about, you know, their big accounts and then the tail. I don't, I've never been a fan of that. Having owned you don't my own want to refer business. to people as the tail. No, you know, having owned my own business, it's like one of those things you would never do. You know, it's like everybody that walks through your door is there as a client and is... Yeah you know, should be treated. Yeah, same, really. to bring it back to music, I think it was going to populist mm. as well, Chris Martin and perhaps by way of Bruce Springsteen saying, everyone who comes to our concert, it could be their first or their last. Yeah. So you have to make every single one count. It's exactly that. Same thing for the clients. Yeah. And I think, you know, you can't turn your nose up at, at anything. I think I've always felt like that about the business. I think it's, um, you know, there's a bit of two schools of thought around that. I think some of uh, the... Maybe the generation you're talking about that still read DNA D, you know, might not want to work on certain brands. I've never looked at it like that. And, you know, I had a very, very interesting conversation that, that really changed my view of advertising. When I came out of Abbott Me Vickers, um, which was all DNA D and amazing, amazing agency. I loved it. It was a brilliant time there. But it was all like you'd walk past someone and they'd be like, or they'd be see what you were doing and go, oh, that would get in the book. That would get in the book. It was just the expression that would get in the book, mm. which is great. And, you know, I, I, I got a phone call from Rich Flintham at Fallon at the time when Fallon, they weren't, they weren't huge at all. And obviously he's now part of Leo's. Mm -hmm. But um, he rung me because we'd had an argument, kind of, not an argument, but a tense conversation. They were doing BT and so were we. And I was designing something and he didn't agree with it. But he loved the conversation, so he phoned me. And I uh, said, do you want to come down and have a chat? I was a bit surprised. And well, it came through Karina Wilshire, actually, who was the, the uh, MD at the time. But um, I went down there and I had my book, you know, my portfolio of laminates, as it was then. No pre-internet in that way. And I talked to him about everything, and I was going, well, that's in the book, and that's DNAD, and that's, that's been there, that's been there, you know, all through the lens of awards. And oh, it just makes me embarrassed even thinking about it now. And he just turned around and went, did any of it work? <laughs> did any of your work work? And I just walked out of there and went, oh my good God, I've never really thought about it like that. You know, I was young and pr probably naive, but didn't really, I'd never really connected the two. Like effectiveness. Know. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And it completely changed, you know, it completely changed the way I thought. Because however, you know, brilliant your thinking might be, is it going to work? It's really incredibly important. And that, that made that conversation, to be honest. Yeah, that's been... It makes that's, me embarrassed to think about it now. But it's perfectly plausible if you go into the industry as a creative that your first thought is on the aesthetic hmm. side of things. And I've been thinking about this a lot recently, the idea that... Um, 
there has to be some consideration of the fact that, you, you know, you're not just an artist to mm. make art. It has mm. to actually do something. Yeah, 100%. Um, me and my brother were talking about this. I was saying about the fact that in the industry, obviously, when people say best TVC of all time, people always say Guinness Surfer. Yeah. Um, and um, my brother says, yeah, uh, uh, effective, obviously, AMV, mm. Guinness, huge, mm. but uh, adverts for advertisers, perhaps, because it's a great film. Yeah, it's a brilliant film. Um, and I was just reflecting on the fact that I've not heard anyone talking about how effective, as you know, one of my favourite campaigns the last 20 years was the Old Spice mm. revivification of about 2009. Incredible, 10. yeah. Yeah, it turned... Unbelievable. An old brand that no one yeah. was interested in into a really cool up-to-date yeah, thing. quickly as well. Quickly, yeah. yeah. Have you seen, have you, is there anything else that is quickly, that comes to mind that's done that, that's revived something? Or, yeah, just, just turned yeah, its I fortunes around? Yeah, I think Skoda. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's still one of my favourite adverts of all time and I've, I've talked about it before, but Factory Tour, you know, we're lucky to have Skoda still in the building. It's an amazing bit of business and incredible car as well, you know, but it's the Factory Tour ad where they they managed to get so many proof points into a 30-second spot, still make it funny, and it completely changed the perception of the brand, you know. Yeah. It's an unbelievable feat to do that. You know, Fallon took out the famous ad of, there's now a waiting list for Skoda. Yeah. Fallon. You know, it was an incredible way of looking at it. Uh, what business. year was that? God knows. I haven't got a clue yeah. when that was. Because I remember a time when... It had nothing to do with it. I just have always admired it from yeah. a massive far. You know, it's incredible. Well, I, I remember when Skoda and Kia were the brands that people that got one of those. Yeah, and, and now they're... part of every joke in the country. You know, yes. if you don't, they had people crying in the showrooms, was the famous... <laughs> Thing, kids crying in the showrooms when your mum and dad were going to buy a Skoda. So, you know, it's to change that perception round is pretty, pretty amazing, yeah. you know. And they've just gone from strength to strength and we made a, an amazing ad for them last year. You know, I think Gareth Graham and the team, Shaka, uh, making the robot spot was absolutely amazing for Enyaq. Yeah. You know, they're still making and buying incredibly brilliant work. I think... Um... Going back to what we were saying before about the idea that, you know, some uh, people, uh, there's a perception that some clients are more important than others. Probably comes from so people like me. I didn't, um, I did not grow up in the industry. Mm. Uh, my first exposure to it was Mad Men. Mm. And they give this impression that it's like, yeah, we're just doing the work. Oh, an automobile. It's a huge client. It's way bigger than everything else. Yeah, yeah, and, you yeah. know, and it's going to snow the, 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 the agency under. Uh, perhaps is what, you know, one of the reasons I got the impression, though, well, so, you know, if it's an automobile, it's just more important than all the other clients or mm. something like that. And that's something that you don't at all subscribe to. No, not at all. I think if every client's the same. I think every client's problem should be treated in a similar way. Yeah. You know, if any business problem that they bring to our door, you know, it shouldn't be like, oh, that sounds a bit dull. Don't know about yeah. that. It's, it's, the, the problem is there to be solved and solved in a creative way that, you know, everybody sees. Yeah, and yeah, yeah you wouldn't want to be taking a problem with someone else and then being, well, it's not a WPP agency. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, or uh, like yeah. another holding group. Exactly. Um, so I'm, I want to talk a bit about uh, music here. I am um, always getting people uh, in my, well, mostly in my family, mm. uh, saying... Um, um, you know, we've seen the new McDonald's advert because there's always a big, the, yeah. the music Huge choices there are always music. a big deal. How long are you, Simon Lloyd at DMB was saying that John Lewis back at uh, Adam mm. and Eve spent three months making it, three months arguing about the music. Mm -hmm. and what's it like when you're making, let's say, the big Christmas ad for, for McDonald's? I mean, it's an incredible uh, brand. Yeah. Let's start there. And the relationship, obviously, is in, absolutely amazing. It's a real partnership. I didn't quite realise that when I stepped through the door. I mean, Shaka told me that before we got here, but it really is a partnership. And music is so incredibly important to them. You know, it's the, to the clients, and they're an incredible kind of set of clients as well. But they, they, they know what works for them as well. You know, they do have the, a kind of style, but then you, you, you break out of it. You know, when you look at something like, uh, Christmas, where you're recording with the real artist or you're re-recording a song with the real artist and you've thought that through and you do it. It's it's a big process, you know, and an enormous part of the job because it's so important. The music is always important on every spot. Yeah. And how you craft that and how it works is, you know, I think, you know, intrinsic to the work. Yeah, the, the, thing, the thing that's impressive about, about McDonald's is that, from a music perspective is they're one of the only brands I could think of 
who've elbowed their way into most memorable brand mnemonic mm. that isn't Intel. Because mm. people always say to us, like, can you make a sting? We want something like Intel. And that's like, well, you just want it to be famous like Intel. Yeah, but yeah. You don't want a, a, a computerized sounding dun, dun, yeah, dun, dun. yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was that was the main reference. But now it's that and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it's gone from I'm loving it to that mnemonic. I mean, it's incredibly powerful as well. Yeah. The five note sting as it's called on a script. But, you know, it's the, the music side of it on, with Maccas as well is just so... It's so enjoyable to find the right tracks. You know, if you look back on what we've used in the last kind of couple of years from Cindy Lauper, you know, being re-recorded, obviously, you know, to Kellis, to Westlife, you know, to Bucks Fizz about to, to break at some point. You know, there's a lot of real canon of, and old soul classics as well. Yeah. But it, if it's helping the story and it's helping you understand the mood we're trying to convey, then... That's the point. And obviously, you know, I think my favourite spot when I joined, which was already kind of in, in production, was Welcome Back yeah. with Mark Morrison. You know, when the nation opened back up and, and McDonald's opened back up, nailed it. I mean, unbelievably feel good. Yeah. And that started from, from Twitter as well. You know, Return yeah. of the Mac was something that the public wanted, so why not give it to them? And I think that, that piece of music is incredible on that spot and a brilliant ad. I think the imp- the the impressive uh, thing that uh, uh, that we saw recently was that I think yeah it was the Christmas just gone. Mm. People were saying the, the McDonald's ad was the best one of the whole stable, mm. um, which of course for years had been like John Lewis. John Lewis is staple. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree, but I'd kind of get there within a child the year before as well. Yes, if I'm, I'm not biased. That, that, but, oh, the one with the yeah, yeah exactly, remarkable. which is an unbelievable piece of animation. Maureen Steph wrote that with you know, uh, and Andy and Jim creative directed their brilliant teams, and you know. The whole whole agency was very happy with that one. I think they're both properly up there, you know. And that's the ones that I've been luckily enough to vicariously to watch yeah. going on, you know. But brilliant, brilliant spots. So I wanted to, there's a couple of things we're going to um, uh, skim through now. And then it is, you know, we're getting on for 40 minutes. It's flown cool. by, but I know you're probably, there's probably a, a fair bit to do today, isn't there? Yeah, it usually is. <laughs> so um, the first thing was we want to talk about uh, pitching and how you handle the process and mm. mostly the artistry of the pitch um, in terms of when you're going up for a new mm. piece of business. Um, you know, how do you how do you walk the client through it? Does someone, do you know, uh, is it the, you know, is it the ECDs and the CCO who do the whole thing or do you hand over to... No, us? definitely. I think it's a team sport. The one thing about, uh, since I've joined Leo's, is Shaka is an incredible um, personality and is brilliant at the cell. So, you know, our two roles are very different. If you look at it, I mean, I described this to Shaka and she was like, okay, that's nailed it. She goes out and I go in. So, you know, Shaka's role in new business is being just brilliant. So a lot of the time she will lead new business. But of course we get the teams involved. Of course people should present their own work. We're great believers in that. The creatives should be involved in the pitching side of things. I do less of it than I've ever done, which is because you're usually kind of, if one of you is pitching, you're totally kind of in that zone. And then one of you is helping to look after the rest of the business at that time. Right. Not that Shaka's just off doing that, but, you know, you have that balance of it. If new business is, is important and also does take up some time. Yeah. So you've always got to balance that out with one of you, is front door, back door, if you're looking right, at it like that, yeah. which is good. Right, so um, that, does it, that does help. Uh, it certainly helps me to understand things. I was, we were drafted to help Ogilvy with a, with a pitch mm. for a big account. And it was, it's, it, you know, just to, to your point of how much time and resource new business can take. Mm-hmm. I was still getting, you know, WhatsApps and emails. So can you just send this at about half 11 at night yeah. on a Sunday? It's always really busy. I mean, it's, I think it's still an industry debate, isn't it? Does pitching work? How, how do you get, does the process work? Do we all agree with it? I mean, I don't think it'll ever change. No. It won't ever change. It's always quick or, you know, there's always a lot of work in it. It's always late. It's always harder than you think you always have a moment halfway through where you think you've you drop it as well where you go oh my god is this any good i don't know it's off completely kind of lost the plot and then you pick it back up and you know it works there's there's a real rhythm to it i mean how it works but i think the team here you know with charlie carly josh tom you know everybody is really committed to it but also you are doing a day job you've got to always remember that you know not everybody's off just 
running amok on new business without uh, thinking of um, what's going on in the day. You mentioned day job there and that uh, uh, triggered in my mind or made me think of the buzzword that's come about in perhaps the last decade, which is our buzz term, which is a side hustle. <laughs> what do you, do you keep an eye on uh, your guys doing the stuff? You know, I love like it. I think, it's, no, I think it's really good if everybody's got a side hustle or something funny. I was chatting to someone about it yesterday. Uh, you know, when I was, I had um, 101, uh, yeah, uh, which technically wasn't a side hustle because it was your own business. But I, I had a side hustle doing a fashion label with Paul Weller. So that was quite a good side hustle to do. It was, wasn't was successful, but we had a good couple of years mucking about trying. That sounds really cool. How did that relationship come about? Uh, very funnily, one, one of my mates, Alex, um, was shopping in Notting Hill when he was in a shop called Tonic at Westbourne Park. And Paul was in there chatting to Phil, who owns Tonic. Uh, talking about doing their own label. And we were working for French Connection at the time. And Alex, who's a proper hustler, said, oh, my mate could help you with that because they were talking about branding and stuff. And they phoned 24 hours later for some apparent, you know, no apparent reason, totally fortuitously. Yeah. And so we went in that weekend. We did a bit of branding for them because it was called Real Stars Are Rare. Um, Did some quite Ivy League looking work. And they liked it. And it just went from there. And we just kind of helped them out when we needed to. So yeah. that was very cool. Yeah, it was a nice time. Nice little side hustle with Paul Weller. Yeah. Uh, not everyone has that on their CV. Um, Paul Weller, let's talk about music. Just, per, you know, your personal taste in music. What is, you know, is there any are there any records that either, you know, started off a, a relationship with music, as in, you know, that's the first record you yeah. ever went for. Are there any t- big records for you that you would always go back to? Yeah, definitely. And oddly enough, um, the Paul Weller thing is quite, quite weird because I was, a, you know, growing up in, when I did, born in early 70s, you know, late 80s, there was the mod revival, or early 80s, there was the mod revival, mm-hmm. which was led by Weller and coming out of punk and whatever else. And that was the first kind of, albums that I really loved you know I, I remember seeing my generation by the who in a in a, what would have been our price probably in Watford High Street and just I loved it I just loved the look of it I didn't know how it sounded or anything but there was a stencil typeface that I can still picture now and John Entwistle in a Union Jack jacket it was something that appealed to me about it so I, I bought that album and then that was around the time of that that kind of revival so uh Working with Paul Weller was quite weird because he he was probably uh, an idol at that moment. Yeah. I think All Mod Cons was one of my favourite albums. Yeah, I feel like with that the, time. with with gentlemen of um, uh, uh, not gentlemen, just with people of your vintage, let's say mm. um, the two that come up are always it's the, it's the Jam or the Sex Pistols. Yeah, exactly. You know, and so um, I was too young for the Pistols. Do you know, yeah, that just was, about right. Would be yeah, like eight years it, old. It was definitely too. Yeah, just that bit beyond it. Mm. Whereas that that felt so much more accessible when I was like eleven, twelve, whatever. Yeah. When all my guns came out, you know, you can you can see. Uh, I think anyway, you can see those those influences because as you, as you said, the music had a huge aesthetic component at that mm. point. It was your fashion choices. It Absolutely, was, it was the art, you subculture. Had on yeah, um, and I'm not not to do it. I'm, I'm not saying this. In a nostalgic sense, I wasn't there, so I can't be nostalgic for it. <laughs> I'm not saying things aren't as good anymore. You don't see as clearly distinguished tribes anymore. No, I think it's, it's, it's big. It's it's a lot more meshed together, uh, to use a line from The Incredibles. Um, but um, the uh, the the thing that's interesting that I'm seeing in advertising music is that you can hear the influences, I think, of decision makers at brand level. Could mm. be wrong about this. Mm. Because you can see it sort of heave and churn over time that now we're in an era where there's a lot of re-records of big 80s pop hits yeah, totally. like Together in Electric Dreams mm. that was on John Lewis. Or mm. um, there was the great... Uh, was time it? after time. Time after time. Mm. And there was right. a bit different Creep, uh, the Radiohead Creep mm-hmm. cover. I think it was by Arlo Parks. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. Mm. Uh, for... Um, Oh, I've forgotten who that was for. It was for a, a, um, a charity for kids. Um, is that is that how the, the process I works? I don't know. It's funny, but we were having this subcultures conversation uh, recently because it's like a, when you look at drill, it's probably bigger than all of those subcultures that we had at the time. Yes. You know, even it was getting, in a scale, it's Britpop-esque. Yeah. So it's just not seen through probably clothing or heard by as many people as it was 
you know, because uh, it's just not mainstream. It's not a mainstream subculture like a Britpop or like yeah. an indie or like a baggy, if you're going back that far or whatever that you're talking about. But that's that's an interesting side of it, that there is these subcultures around, but they're just not as uniformed or don't have that definitive look that everybody had. It's more just straight. Yeah. yeah. Like, well, well, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, but <laughs> it's an interesting thing. But with the, the marketers and music, I think it's what fits. It's what fits the ad. Yeah, I think if you look at you know IKEA doing a drill track or whatever, it's it's it still fluctuates. Yeah, but you know, I don't know, I don't know whether that's the case or not. Whether it's it's marketing led or it's more just what works to convey the emotion in the spot or convey the idea in the spot. Some of those those songs are properly classic, aren't they? Yeah. And yeah. bringing them back just gives you maybe a nostalgic edge, but a lot of people never have heard that. You know, we were, um, I spent uh, last Thursday and Friday at Butlins, actually, with one of our clients, with our clients. And uh, one of the things we went to see when we were at Butlins was a Queen tribute act. Yeah. And Joe Beveridge is going to hate me for saying this, but I'm going to say it, Joe. And he was like, what is this song? And they were doing it. And it was <laughs> Bohemian Rhapsody. What is this? And we were like, what? <laughs> what? He was like, I know it, but I just don't know it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And. So you forget there's a generation that hasn't heard or hasn't feasted on the music that we grew, grew up with or, you know, a different generation has grown up with. They just haven't heard it. Yeah. You know, I've got a 23-year-old son that's constantly introducing me to new music the same way as I introduced him to new music. Yes. You know, last weekend it was Big Thief and Narlo Parks and that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, you're constantly consuming new music. Yes. But the relationship kind of changes slightly, I think. Absolutely. And we also now, I think, have the opportunity. I think I may have been, uh, maybe stepping out of line, but the, fir- the first generation that had the walls broken are on, you know, what music you listen to. Mm. So um, there's an author called Alex Ross who wrote a book called Listen to This. He said, uh, I felt mm. like I grew up in the 30s and 40s, not in the 60s and 70s, because mm. I only listened to those records. Yeah. And I, when I was 14, everyone was listening to the Arctic Monkeys and I was only listening to the Beatles. And I was, Amazing. you know, getting obsessed with the, you know, whatever the scandals were that had already taken place for yeah. 40 years ago. Now you've got Disney Plus and everyone's got that. And I noticed, you know, mm. say the, the big nine-hour Beatles documentary mm. came about. And everyone I know over the age of 45 was, hey, you got to watch this thing, you got to watch this thing. But there were no, like, 20-year-old kids going, you got to watch the Beatles thing. No, and, uh, nine hours of that is yeah. the other thing, isn't it? I mean, Spike, my son, is he's incredibly into his music and he, he loves the Beatles. I'd be really surprised if he sat down for nine hours yeah. of it. Because that's know. a I know he's watched it. I don't think he's... I bet he's watched it half of it on... yeah. Let's just forward this bit. They're just yeah. having a chat. You know, I would love it. I love that that gig was I thought was iconic at the time. Don't let me down and whatever else. But I, I haven't actually seen it. I want to watch it. But I, I mean, to your it. point about you know, it's not everyone. So it's like, how do you not know and worship at the altar of Bohemian Rhapsody? It's like, well, that's not the case anymore. We don't all just look Completely. up to the same idols. No, yeah. and it's interesting. You were listening to the Beatles while everybody else was listening to the Arctic Monkeys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I eventually caught up. <laughs> Brilliant band. Yeah, so um, um, so I think it's uh, probably almost time uh, to to wrap up. What's 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 going on at the moment for you? What are you about to get in, stuck into? Uh, I haven't actually looked. I think I've got some internal meetings at early doors, and then uh, hopefully um, we just uh, we're chatting to McDonald's about what is a fairly big idea uh, yesterday that's got them quite excited. So hopefully we have a little bit more afters on that and we'll see where that one goes. But and you've got, do you say you've got Tui as well? Good for September. Yeah. Yes. That's yeah. a holiday Tui's, season coming up. Tui's good. Tui's a great account. Lovely, lovely people as well. Yeah, and holiday season coming up. I mean, I think everybody, hopefully, you know, will we'll be a bit braver and get away, you know, this year. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot booked in already, so let's just hope. It all goes straightforwardly. Uh, Mark Elwood, thank you for talking to me. Cheers, Greg. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.